Hey there, it's the Catalyst Sessions. I'm Bill DeYoung from the St. Pete Catalyst. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. My guest today is Duncan McClellan, who is uh, a world-renowned uh, art glass maker, a glass artist, although he's not made of glass, um, and uh, who's been in this area for 10 or 11 years now and made all kinds of strides into making this the glass coast, which is uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about. Hey there, buddy, how are you? Oh, doing fine. Thanks for having me on. You you have the domain name glasscoast.com. Does that still belong to Correct. you? Okay. Oh, yeah. So, which is, is great. And I know that, that you've been out there as part of the movement to make this become the Glass Coast for lots of reasons for a while now. Tell me why you did that and what you mean by the Glass Coast. Well, Glass Coast, um, it, we have a significant amount of glass entities uh, places, uh, artists to see here. And one of my goals was to uh, outreach throughout the country to get groups to travel here, heads, beds, come in and see all the different entities, uh, all the different venues that we have. And I was successful. Um, last year I went out, uh, gave two talks, one in Phoenix, one on the other coast of Florida. And uh, for this past March, we had planned uh, two groups coming to visit with uh, 40 each. And that was just in the beginning. So if I could replicate maybe 10 talks a year um, in, the, in my thinking at the time, we could get a significant amount of people coming here, getting hotels, restaurants, uh, buying things, um, uh, enjoying what St. Pete is. Does that and, come naturally to you, Duncan, to be, you know, an ambassador, to be the, the, the glass ambassador? I'll try and jam those words together at some point. The glass, you know, in other words, between what you have and the Imagine, the Jehovah Collection, and the other places, right here, there's a lot of glass art here. But not everybody's going out crossing the country and raising the flag, come and visit this place. To your mind, is like visit St. Pete, Clearwater not doing enough? I mean, well, that's why, why do we, why do, why do you need to do it? Is what I'm saying. I don't feel that they're giving enough uh, emphasis on the arts that we really do have something to sell uh, in tourism here. Uh -huh. And uh, we really need uh, more budget. And just like I started my business, uh, as well as our educational charity. Yeah. What you do is you fund it yourself. <laughs> you go out there, you start some things, other people see what's happening and then they buy into it. But just going out asking people for money and effort without you having built something, you're not going to get traction. So uh, that was my goal with glasscoast.com mm -hmm. is to see that we could build up that site and build up the artists uh, that are uh, artists, venues, galleries that are included in on that site. And we've funded every, uh, DMG, uh, uh, our gallery has funded everything to date. Um, although John Collins, uh, Trey, uh, and Stewart have been very helpful in putting a group together Sure. Uh, to be able to see if we can't take it further. Well, it but, takes time, doesn't it? Yeah. Especially in the new environment we have, we now have new priorities and trying to do something collectively when you're trying to keep your house from burning down doesn't work right now. Right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to talk with you about your personal journey, which we did an interview in The Catalyst I want to say it was two years ago, man, but it's, it's been a while. And uh, the, the, the fact is that the, the facts of history don't change. Um, let me, I, I'm clicking around here madly trying to, trying to bring things up. I have some pictures I want to look at. You, uh, you're from New York, but you, didn't you say you spent most of your younger life in Orlando? Yeah? Oh, yeah. I grew up in Orlando okay. um, and came to Tampa when I was, uh, I was able to leave high school early. So I, I got a scholarship to go to HCC. And so I booked it to Tampa. 
I want to back up for a minute, though, Duncan, because you told me that your, your dad was in marketing and PR yeah. in Orlando. And, and I don't know, folks, if you know this about Duncan McClellan, but both Walt Disney and Colonel Sanders had dinner <laughs> at the family home when he was young. <laughs> any, any memory? I mean, no, nobody else has a story quite like that. Can you share anything there? I mean, I guess Uncle Walt was starting to buy up the land around there at the time, huh? Exactly, and it was uh, my job, my dad's job, to keep it kind of quiet. Uh, oh yeah, and to really suppress any kind of news getting out because they needed to buy enough land to be able to do what they wanted to do. Um, yeah, that was interesting. We were sworn, sworn to secrecy. I don't think I ever told anybody until I was a teenager. Now it can be told. <laughs> so. So he obviously worked worked closely with the Disney company. It was kind of, yeah, that's right. It, particularly in the advanced portion of it. Not yeah. so much after they acquired all the land. We're talking like 64, 63, 64. Yes. Yeah. And you were just a tot, just a little little kid. <laughs> and Colonel Sanders, I mean, how cool is that? You know, I, young people today don't know, even know who Harlan Sanders is. Yeah, was. right. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we had Mr. Clean over. Uh, wow. Remember. I bet you had to keep the, the place like speck and span before he got there, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Can you imagine uh, so having Mr. Easy. Clean over in the time of COVID, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you told me that, that you, it was at the New York World's Fair in 64 that you first saw someone glass blowing and went and went. That's cool. Is that, is that that accurate, that story? Well, it, it was uh, pretty accurate. My yeah. uh, dad came home. Uh, he always liked to surprise us. And he said, next week, we're going to New York. I had uh, seven brothers and sisters. Wow. And we had an old Valiant station wagon. And uh, he said, next week, I want you to see the Pieta. It's going to be at the New York World's Fair, and I want you to see it. Yeah. So uh, uh, dad's idea of going to see that was to drive the 26 hours straight, see it, get in the car and come back. Well, even having a tinkle can in the back when we'd have to crawl over Seven all the sisters to go pee in the back. Oh, uh, and so, but my mom would always want to stop. So we would stop at south of the border, where we'd yeah. stop uh, to dig Indian arrowheads, and then we stopped at Glencoe Glassworks. And um, previously, on another trip, we had lost my sister. She was left at a gas station, oh. and we didn't realize it till 200 miles later. So oh that's a trip. When we went on trips, we had to call. Uh, we were by number. Uh, and they kept calling my name, my number, and I wouldn't show up because I kept hiding to watch the glass blowers. Wow. So you went to Glencoe, and that was the thing that, I mean, did, was that a life-altering moment or just as a kid, something, boy, that's cool. I mean, or did that just stick with you? Forever? Well, I think that's common with all of us. Uh, there's that moment in time in our lives where something you see something, you do something, it clicks. Um, you don't know if you'll ever be involved in it. You don't know if you ever, but you knew that that was the coolest thing you had ever seen. Well, same thing for me, but I didn't get to start blowing until I was 30 years old. Yeah, so you said but you, you had a lot of jobs in between. A oh, lot yeah. of jobs. You're a graphic designer. You were, uh, I think you, you made leather belts or something, as I recall. Right. You were almost a restaurateur. So what, what changed? Was it like, hey, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I saw somebody making you know, art glass. I'm going to go try What changed? How did that all happen? Well, I'd always been involved in our family. All of us did, made something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did some kind of art form or poetry or sculpture or something. Mm -hmm. uh, photography was a big thing. Um, and uh, so, you know, having worked in leather when I was 14, I had a line of belts uh, that I sold to stores. Wow. Uh, when I was uh, in my later teens, I worked in clay. Uh, I wasn't really that good or satisfied by it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then I went into working for a circus, uh, doing some graphic design, and uh, then um, came back to um, came back to Tampa uh, to work with friends of mine that were own, opening a cosmetic chain. Yeah. Because I knew something about color. They wanted me involved, and I bought in, and we started uh, uh, some retail stores out at the Tampa airport. Well, Duncan, we, we, let me stop you there. I mean, were you always looking for the thing that clicked with you most? I mean, this is a lot of moving around. You were an advanced man for a circus, I think you told me. Yeah, exactly. You weren't riding elephants or no, you know, no, walking no, the no. wire. But I mean, was it sort of that, that long kind of lusty search for the thing that's going to feel right to me? I'll try this, I'll try that, I'll try that. Or was it just, it just happened that way when, when you... No, well, quite honestly, everything I did felt right to me. Yeah. Uh, so working in the restaurants, uh, doing the graphic design, starting the retail, it all felt right. Mm -hmm. But in the latter part of the retail end, I started realizing that I like creating the retail. I like developing the business, but I don't necessarily love running them. Yeah. Um, and so as my interest and I started taking a few lessons uh, and as my interest came up in glass, I found myself bringing my glass into the store, working on it during the day as I'm also doing my other job. And then at a point I went, you know, you're 30 years old. If you don't give it a shot now, you'll never give it a shot. Uh -huh. You have, you're selling off your retail stores. So I bought myself two years of time. Yeah. And I figured after two years, if nothing clicked, I would open another retail or start, start something new. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to give it a shot. So what did you do? You were, you were in Hillsborough County by then. So yeah, I saw a little classified ad in the paper that they were giving lessons down in Evil. Yeah. And uh, Dean James was the guy. And um, I, I went to him and I said, I want to sign up, but I'm a highly addictive personality. And if I can't rent time after, I really don't want to get involved in this because this is something I really want to do. And I don't want to just take a three-week course. And he said, no problem. Wow. I'll rent your time. Well, I called him every two weeks for two years. And he would tell me, call me back in two weeks. <laughs> Getting frustrated, I was going to New York to do buying. And I went, there's got to be a place in New York. And I found the New York Experimental. Yeah. And that's where I, it was the best. What Dean did was the best thing for me because I would have never uh been able to learn some of the techniques i've learned or the people i've met without having that experience so it was great for me how long did you uh, did you work at the experimental i mean how long did this go on go flying back and forth as you were well it was like so teddy roosevelt going on safari because <laughs> i would send like nine boxes up and then of my tools and color and everything else like a whirlwind be up there for five days because that's all I could afford and then pack everything up. And that's how I met Chuck Books here in St. Pete mm -hmm. uh, because here I'm packing up my work and two guys there said, hey, can we give you a hand? And then they see my address and they were both from St. Pete. Uh, Len Neff, mm -hmm. who was the first class artist in this area, and Chuck Books that built the first hot shop in this area in St. Pete. And um, it, he, um, that's where I started working after yeah. he built out the studio. You uh, eventually, okay, uh, I'll fast forward a little bit. We'll go through, you know, the, the hard times. But uh, eventually what you did, as I recall, was uh, you started doing it full time. You started selling at art shows. And, when do you realize that, I, I remember wondering this when I spoke to you, because it was the first time I met you, now I can ask you, when do, when do you realize while you're doing that, that your stuff is good enough to 
to show people and attempt to sell to people? When does that moment happen? Well, it's kind of <laughs> what I mentor. Um, you know, you have to be very proud of that piece before you're going to allow the public to see it. Yeah. But don't be so overly critical that you don't have it out there and you don't get feedback. Um, one of the things that I was very lucky when I started out doing shows is that there'd be a first, second, third prize in the glass category, and there were only two glass artists. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of uh, very good things that I uh, happened to me that way. And it allowed me to, because all those awards that you get are like mini grants. And it would allow me to do more work and learn and do more. And um, uh, it's, it was very, very helpful. I really think that the outdoor festival system is a really great system for artists. Um, it, it hones you in a lot of ways. Didn't you tell me once that uh... Uh, you, I was in Boca or someplace where somebody, somebody with a bunch of money just walked by and said, I'll take everything or something like that. I mean, what's that story you told me once? <laughs> well, I was at Coconut Grove for the first time. Okay. And this guy, I'm setting up, this guy, it's six in the morning. This guy looks down from his balcony and he comes down in his bathrobe and he says, I would like these two pieces. And I said, sure. So we carried him up to, and he took him upstairs, and he came down with the check. And this time he was dressed, and he said, look, I uh, redesigned my whole uh, house I'm building, and I put in about 30 niches just for your work. So I want you to buy, sell me 30 pieces. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you have That's 30 not the pieces? Way to buy art. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, uh, you know, his name was Gene, and Gene, yeah. you know, let me, I promise I'll fill them off, but let me do this over a period of several years. This way, you're going to get the best I can give you. You'll have a varied, uh, a better collection, and I'll put some loners in, <laughs> but they're loners. You're not going to keep, uh, we're going to get you, a, and he built a huge collection. And uh, then about four years later, he decided to build a new house. And he sold it lock, stock, and barrel down to the pots and pans, but wouldn't sell the guy my artwork. He'd sell all the other artwork, but not that. And the guy said, no, I want it. You built it for this. And so he said, look, I'll introduce you to him. And he did. And I ended up filling those niches <laughs> over a period of about five years. Uh, so that was a, a, a hell of a chance um, sale. What is it for you about glass that say you, you had tried working in pottery before, working with clay, uh, the other things you do? What is it about glass and, and uh, you know, is it the ability to, to uh, you know, to create things that didn't exist before that are just fragile and hold, the way they hold the light. I mean, it's a sort of very general question. Why glass? Why did that do it for you? Why did that become your thing? Well, that, that's a good question because, you know, why does an artist pick a particular thing? Well, right, right. in my case, glass is, is so uh, malleable and, uh, a, you know, it can be transparent. It can be translucent. It can be opaque. It can look very fluid. It can look very hard. It can look very uh, soft. Um, the, there's so many different things that can be used. It really is, in some ways, uh, the most ideal uh, material to work in because of the different ways it can be utilized. The drawback to glass is the expense in you in using the material it's one of the most expensive mediums to work in uh it's not just hot glass it warm glass cold working uh all of it uh, is is very expensive and you know comparing it to other art forms if i make a small mistake and i'm a painter yeah 
it's covered. Sure you pay. I make a small mistake in a piece, it's garden art <laughs> in my garden. I can't even sell it. Uh, and I have a few examples of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, perfect pieces, they're huge, but it's got a, a major, you know, a flaw that can't be utilized. Um, so it's really something that um, I think glass artists love that part of it is that heartbreak that happens when you're trying for it. You know, if it was always successful, what's the reward? Oh, I get it. You know? Yeah. Especially when you have glass is a team sport, too. And it's not done singularly. Uh, during the gas conference, we had a year, yeah, in a year ago. Yeah. yeah, about a year ago. Um, we had in one demonstration, 21 people on the floor, all working on the same piece. Wow. On different benches, different parts of the room, all bringing these parts. One poor guy had to turn the pipe back and forth for four hours, just keeping that piece hot. You know, I just can't you know. imagine the guilt trip though. If you're the one guy out of the 20 or whatever who, who screws up, and, oh, I dropped it. Everybody's, you know, the whole thing's gone. You can't, it's not like you can pick up the pieces and put it back together. No, doesn't work. <laughs> okay, I'd like to look at a couple of photos of the gallery. Uh, Duncan McClellan Glass, is it, is it glass or glass in gallery? I'm never sure. I've heard you call it both things. It's Duncan McClellan ga Glass, glass, glass. You tell me, what, well, what's, what's your glass place called? Gallery, a glass kind of covers the whole concept. Okay. Because uh, we fabricate, we do commercial things, uh, we do things for outside of restaurants and schools, but we also do the artwork there as well. You, um, have, you have the work of, yeah, you've got a, an incredible hot shop there in the school, which I want to talk about too. You've got the work of, what, 100 artists, including yourself? Yeah, over a hundred artists, uh, uh, quite internationally. Um, in fact, the image that you're showing, uh, that's Richard Jolly, one of the pillars of the entire uh, uh, glass uh, movement. Um, he is very unusual in that he makes his own glass and his own colors. Mm -hmm. um, and we just had a Zoom meeting with him, inviting our collectors from all over the world and doing studio tours. And that's something else we're doing. Uh, we have ones coming up uh, dealing with artists in Australia. And even though it, this whole last four months have been a pivot, it's been really exciting how we can reach and communicate, quite honestly, better than we were before. I mean, there's nothing tactile about it, though. You can't, you're not in a room with the work. Uh, you know, it's like dancing about architecture, right? I mean, you can only go so far. I used to say that, that writing about music, which I did for so many years, is a lot like dancing about architecture. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, how does, how does that happen? How are the meetings going so well? I heard you tell that to, to Joe and Chris on the other, uh, the podcast that you did. How well, that I, I will tell you that it has been, uh, I'm encouraged by how successful it's been. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the clients that are purchasing things that both know our gallery very well and they know the artist in, in most of the times. And they know that if we sent them something and they, it wasn't what they had in mind, we would deal with that. You know, we would take care of that. Sure. Uh, but uh, we are open. Uh, we are taking reservations uh, so that some of the people that are here locally that have seen it uh, on one of our Zoom uh, meetings uh, can make an appointment and come in and see it in person. You're, you're not open for someone to just walk in. I wasn't going to ask you this. You, you do it by appointment now. <laughs> well, that's our preferred way uh, because we like to have 15 minutes between guests to yeah. rewind. I do a, a full sanitation schedule in the morning. It takes about an hour including a uh, fog, uh, fog disinfectant machine. Yeah. Um, and 
We like to be able to redo the handles, uh, bathrooms in between guests. Um, uh, if people do show up at the door and we don't have a reservation at that time, of course, we're going to be accommodating. Yeah. Uh, we do uh, require face masks. Uh, uh, that's, and that's a city ordinance now, too. Of course. Um, but we have, and we have totally redone the galleries to be touch-free and all kinds of touch-free disinfecting uh, things uh, around the property. The stuff here I'm looking at, you know, I've, I've, I've been in there and I've toured the Chihuly and I've toured the uh, Imagine Museum, of course. And uh, I mean, I can, what I like is that, I don't know, what do you call it, a docent tour or a guide? I mean, I could look at this and say, I mean, oh, this is beautiful, but I'd rather have someone there telling me about it, telling me how it was maybe created or about the artist. Do you do that as well? Oh, that's very much part of our MO. I mean, uh -huh. part of our, our motto is that we're more than a gallery. And our focus, uh, we're focused more on education. Out of our education, we make sales that keep us in business and keep us alive. Uh, but the first and foremost thing is that you have to educate. Um, and uh, it, it gives a much better appreciation uh, by the client. Uh, and even if they're not purchasing that day, um, it's something that sticks with them and they come back. One more picture to look at because, the, and this kind of touches on that too. I, I mean, I know you have the, the school initiative, but the hot shop, I mean, look, uh, people are fascinated. I love, this, this picture is great. Is it open now? Are, is, are people working? I mean, can-, uh, can We have done, uh, well, actually the last couple of days we had some filming being done. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Dan Alexander, our uh, chief gaffer, um, basically was doing things mostly by himself with uh, Lauren opening up the doors for him. Uh, so we're, we're not, you know, we're not doing a 21 team blowing right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're, we're concentrating on being safe, getting ready for the fall um, yeah. and uh, reconditioning each year all the equipment, and you're not seeing, you're only seeing about a third of it, has to be reconditioned. So it takes all summer long. We were just lucky that we didn't have to rebuild the furnace this year, because that is about six weeks of downtime and about $6,000. Uh, but this year, uh, typically you do it every year. This year, the uh, crucible was fine. Well, we are, uh, we're close to the end here, but uh, let's remind people that you are open by appointment. Uh, it's dmglass.com, and uh, you're over in the Warehouse Art District. A former tomato packing plant, I seem to remember. Yeah. How many, how many, what's your square footage on this? a big place, man. Well, the gallery alone is 7,800. That doesn't count the sculpture gardens or the 5,000 square foot awning. And then the hot shop is about 2,400 square feet. Yeah, I was there uh, in the outdoor garden. Uh, you had a, a, a service when my, my friend Bob Andelman passed away out there. Yeah. yeah I think that was right before uh, Mr. COVID came out and shook our hands. And, right. You know, well, it's good to know that you're doing okay, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, thanks, Bill. Like the rest. I really appreciate it. It's great talking to you, Duncan. We will see you, uh, we'll see you again soon. Okay, terrific. Take care of yourself. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.